This is the Generative Commons call for Wednesday, September 22, 2021. Um, and so let me know if that link works. It does. So do you want me to screen share? Is that yes, what please. you That'd be great. That'll right, work so perfectly. Hold on, I have to get out of full screen because it's. Yep. I don't hey, Mr. Carranza. Here. It might, might work better if he does it because now my screen just changed. Oh, wait. Should be okay. So, so if I screen share, and it was this over here. So share. I just sent Stacy a link and she's screen sharing back. Oh, good. Um, okay, good. And oh, he recorded a video of it. That's really nice. Cool. So you can watch that video at your leisure, but that map that you see at the bottom was automatically generated with code and Miro. Uh, and Max is a Miro programmer, among other things. Uh, so what he did was he took the transcript from our call and then tagged it up so that, and because the pattern of the Thursday calls is me playing host and, and, and calling different people into the conversation, that's what this thing looks like. Okay, I will look at it. Um, unless you want me to scroll anymore, is that um, enough? I think we're good because that'll give you an, a chance to get familiar with it uh, okay. and see what happened. And this feels to me like sort of the beginning of a whole bunch of stuff we could just do. And if we were smart about this, we could automate some of the interesting bits uh, so that you know once a call is done, if we like the call, uh, yes, I will. Post it right here. Ba, ba, da, ba. Boom, there you go. Sorry, Mark, I, I meant to do that and then I forgot. I can stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That'd be fine. Thank you, Stacey. You're welcome. Um, and, and so just for examples, um, so far through all of OGM, I download calls. I then up, manually upload them to YouTube. I then post about them on our Mattermost chat. I no longer post them, uh, all the recordings to the Google group. I just post them to the Mattermost chats where they're relevant. Um, all of which is pretty automatable. Like, like all, all that is automatable. And then, and then once we have other artifacts like transcripts, we could then, uh, you know, other people who would like to play with analytics or with, it would, be, it would be a trivial matter, but maybe just a little too trivial to do a word cloud. Uh, of each call, so you could sort of see what words pop, popped up frequently during the call or whatever else. But uh, Bentley and Pete had written uh, utilities that will strip the just the links out of the Zoom chats, which is really handy. Uh, and Bentley's version has options where you can strip out names of who submitted them or keep those in or a couple other things. I don't remember what his options are, but but uh, he was doing that. And then I think it's, it's possible to envision a bunch of things like that, which we then, if we could do these and post uh, the results into the generative commons, then we're like cooking with gas kind of. Well, then we're cooking with flint and steel at least. <laughs> yeah, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, something that I've been thinking about this, something that would be really helpful for humans mm. is, is in starting a call, it's really that can be that convening question, like uh, having a question to just come around. I think that would help in terms of uh, finding those connections, but also at the end of a call, if we could come up with the question that was answered in the call or more than one question, yeah. you know, that would, um, cause then if people were interested in that question, they would know, well, I might be interested in looking at the call. Right, exactly. Um, so a couple of things. I've been lax about creating agendas for our various calls uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which being I'm just not a good ops project management person. Uh, so always having an agenda in front of us is hard for me, um, although although not impossible. Um, and, and, and I was thinking that that process might be automatable a little bit because, because um, so let me just share screen over here just to talk through an idea. Because, for example, here's where I found the the the, the Miro that Max had created because it was connected to uh, two different OGM calls back. Uh, so you know, 
basically here's some some prior call links but i just created this link i just created this link here for today's call because today is uh you know the september 22nd of 2021 happy happy equinox in a couple hours um and what i what the thought i had as i created this thought was gosh wouldn't it be cool if this spawned uh, an agenda page on our on the OGM wiki automatically? And if my notes page down here was in fact like the agenda page or something like that, right? That'd be pretty awesome. And I'm not using the brain that way. The, the notes field is a perfectly capable um, text editor that in fact, um, and this is a little bit of a digression, but I think it's actually really interesting. Uh, I'm running the latest version of the brain, which is the brain 12. Uh, between 11 and 12, he took the notes editor and he added backlinks and a bunch of other Rome-like features, R-O-A-M. And Rome, the cult of Rome is like a, you know, a whole bunch of people are using Rome to do knowledge management and to build knowledge, you know, uh, structures of different kinds, which is really interesting because that's a neighboring community that I would love to involve in what we're doing. Um, and so what if, I mean, I'm not a coder and the brain is not really code programmable. It doesn't really have an API or anything like that. And Stacey, an API is uh, basically a, a way that you can tell a program to do something. So a, a program would publish to you a list of things that says, hey, if you do if you do things with this syntax, I can crank up a new file. I can post something over here. I can give you results to a query, whatever. Uh, and so the brain doesn't really have an API right now. So it's not, you know, even somebody coding from the outside can't ask it or make it do things. But if, but if it did, if, if we were sort of in a more open version of what I'm using, then there's nothing preventing there from being an automatically generated agenda that fits neatly into a sequence and is well titled and lives in the commons uh, that we can then, uh, you know, that other people know about the existence. So we could create a method for posting items to the agenda to cover during the call. There's, there's just a whole bunch of stuff we could have and do pretty automatically. And then when the call is post-processed and reposted to, to the Zooms or whatever, we could put it here. And then I don't know if you've seen in Vincent's trove, but he's gone whole hog on events. And so when there's a, an event on the calendar in trove, um, we can embed the Zoom video there as well, which is pretty cool because then it's visible to a, a different communities. They can find it through Trove. And he also experimented on the last call. He can embed my brain link to that call's thought in Trove. And the embed works. It basically plays in a little frame on that page. So you can scroll down and you can see what, you know, the note taking I, I happen to do uh, in the brain uh, in the call. And that's pretty cool. Um, and many of the things I just said could be automated. It's not that, you know, it's not, not that big a deal to do. And Vincent is very open to, you know, auto, auto, automations and linkages and other kinds of things that, that feed uh, Trove. So, sorry, so I'm, so I'm talking through a whole bunch of different things, but we're not far from having uh, some infrastructure and some automation that might make this more of a rhythm uh, more easy to do, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, for example, an agenda could be created for this call right now uh, at the end of last call. Uh, so it's so the agenda wouldn't have to be created like just in time at the last minute as we walk in. It could, in fact, be, oh, okay, here, here's the promise and so forth. Okay, and that wraps up a, a whole bunch of things I wanted to talk about. Uh, I also want to show the, the Generative Commons page, which we'll come back to. And then there's something else I wanted to mention that's slipping out of my mind right now. Uh, oh, shoot. Um, what was the last thing I just said? About when an agenda could be created. Mm, thank you. Um, okay, I guess I just got it back. So I ran a podcast. Uh, let me just screen share for a second again, because I've got them all here. Uh, so I, I ran a podcast for nine years called the week, the Yi Tan Weekly uh, Tech Call uh, from 2004 to 2013. Uh, it was weekly for a while, then it was biweekly, but twice as long for the last couple of years. Um, I did this with Pip Coburn, who was kind of my co-founder, but I was almost always the host of these calls. It was audio only. Uh, so here's the weekly call archive. And just like you saw here, 
these are these are some of the calls. Uh, and then the only place these calls now exist is in the Internet Archive, amazingly enough, because um, uh, because I was paying a small amount to an Estonian or Lithuanian programmer uh, who would post process the calls a tiny bit and then upload two versions to the archive. And the reason I say two versions is my connection to the question you asked, Stacey, which is that my practice during those calls, which had no video, and that turns out to be an important thing for what I'm about to say, um, somewhere a year or two into the Yitan calls, uh, sorry, and Yitan means conversations about change in Mandarin, which I do not speak. So I'm sure since Mandarin is tonal that it's Yitan or Yitan, and I have no idea. I'm like an idiot here. But, but we call them Yitan for, for grins because it was meant to be sort of casual. Um, but a couple of years in, Pip said, hey, why don't you do a summary at the end of our, of our calls and you know, say what we went through? So my practice during all those calls was to take manual notes on my grid, on my square ruled paper. And I could take five, six, seven pages of notes during one of our calls easily, especially when our calls were 90 minutes long at the end. At the beginning, they were like 45 minutes long. When it was weekly, they were 45 minutes long. When it shifted to bi-weekly, it got longer. It went to the 90 minute format that we're used to now for our check-in calls here. Um, and so I would take five, six, seven, sometimes eight pages of notes. And I would circle as I went taking notes, I would just make circles on it to see what the highlights were. And then at the end of the call for five to eight minutes, I would just look through my notes and read back what we did. And then, and that was good enough that we created two different podcast streams. There was the full call and the summary of the call. And so you could sort of taste the summary and see if you liked it and go listen to the full thing. Problem is me not being an operations guy, the link between the Yitan calls and recordings and all that, and the iTunes store where you could go listen to a podcast, that link was never actually solid and never did any audience building, never, never went out and tried to actually turn it into a legit podcast that had an audience. We, we had like, you know, 70, 80 people that constantly came to the call. The, the calls were really fun and fruitful, um, but it never grew. Um, and so I put it to sleep in, I guess, 2013, uh, a couple of years before podcasting got hot again. And I'll add that on video, I can't be sitting here taking, like my, my life is pretty complicated right now, managing what's going on with Zooms and then feeding my brain during the calls, which is what I kind of do instead of the manual note taking. And the way I take notes in the brain isn't quite enough for me to go back and do a summary. So, so like I'm not taking notes enough to do the same kind of function. And, and it takes a lot of brain cycles to do that function, to do the note taking, because I was also looking at the chat, which we, we hosted in IRC, Internet Relay Chat. So we had an IRC channel open with a chat that was really juicy all the time. Uh, I was busy trying to fix things that broke on the freeconference.com audio section where you couldn't tell where noise was coming from. So you'd have to every periodically say, hey, everybody, could you mute the call? Could you do whatever? And it was not Zoom-like where on Zoom, I can detect who's making noise. And if it's my call, I can mute them, right? So that a lot more control didn't have that. Uh, in, in the nine years, like four or five calls had to be just closed down because somebody put us on their musical hold. And we and like Vivaldi's Four Seasons drowned out our, our conversation. So, and if we all got off and got back in the call, it turned out we were in the same place and the call with the, the Vivaldi Four Seasons was still going. So anyway, that's like three long stories, but the idea of coming back at the end and sort of recapping is something Lauren put in front of us. And we did a couple times on a couple OGM calls, Thursday calls, um, and we didn't make it a practice. Uh, most. Lee, I think because we were trying to get around the room and have everybody check in and we usually didn't make it all the way around the room. So the idea of taking an extra five minutes for check-in would have meant dropping a couple more people from being able to check in. But I like the idea a lot. Well, that's sort of also why I suggested the idea of a question, like I'm thinking like Jeopardy, what is, <laughs> and then, you know, describing what the call was for you. It takes a second, it's one quick yeah. Um, also, the Thursday check-in calls are meant to be a check-in, and we've played with right. the format a little bit, and we haven't changed it very much at all. But it, it's hard to have a question there, although it would be really interesting. It would be really interesting to end with a question in the chat that says, hey, what question came up for you during this call? Like, like what question are you left? What interesting question are you left with at the end of this call? And that would be a very simple thing to do. And if we did it in the chat, 
um, everybody can do it at their own at their leisure, and it doesn't it doesn't require talk time, right? It doesn't it doesn't need the serial talk time. So that would be really simple to do. But then for our calls like today, like we, you know, three other days a week, we have uh, I have standing uh, OGM calls that are meant to be about this is the generative commons. Yesterday was building OGM. And there's no reason why there couldn't be a focusing question for the agenda, which is part of the agenda for those calls going in. Yeah. I'm not being clear because we're talking about like different things we're talking. Okay. So let, let me be clear. In terms of a summary at the end of a call, what I'm saying is it almost the same way each person would say what the title of the show or the call was to put it in the form of a question, like what, what they think if they had to say what question was answered in the call, how they would title it. That's in terms of a summary. In okay. terms of a different call, like a pop-up call or a call that's not the check-in call, that would be a convening question so that anybody that has an interest that comes from any direction but is around that question, right. that would be what kind of connects them. So just to make sure I get it more precisely, so if at the end of every call, five minutes from the end, I asked, what title would you give this call? Correct. Um, and just let everybody riff in the chat on it and step into the conversation if they felt like it, that would that would solve the function. That would do what you're looking for. Correct. Uh, I just this, have a question on my mind. Yeah. I just have that word question on my mind in general. Cool. Um, Mark, does that make sense? Would you add or would you riff on that or, or change it or? So the riff would be um, linking with Jack Park and basically uh, his notion of structured conversation as opposed to unstructured conversation. Um, and his notion of structured comes from the IBIS people um, and the term IBIS conversations um, uh, basically have the ability to be charted into which parts of communication are being done. And it goes back to um, Fernando Flores and... Um, speech act theory. Uh, speech act theory, um, certainly, uh, uh, which is uh, going back to... Uh, um, John Cyril as well, and, and other, other um, linguistic and, and uh, philosophy of language folks. Um, but basically, can we chart our commitments to each other? Um, but also, can we chart things like, do we agree on this? Do we disagree on this? Is there supporting evidence? Is there um, uh, uh, evidence to the contrary? Um, and so starting that type of um, kind of like metadata about communication is interesting. Um, and, you know, the question that comes up for me is, you know, going in the direction of deeper philosophic questions like, um, you know, what is our relationship with language in its informality in our ability to communicate with each other effectively as people and its mechanizability like um yes here are here are here are categories that we use um to make commitments questions agreements um uh, yeah so so again i'm riffing not not really uh um uh, having, you know, uh, thought about what you're both talking about um, that much, but but that is certainly what we do in rituals in the Catholic Church, perhaps in in uh, uh, some of the Jewish services that I've been to. There's call and there's response. There's a leader. There's the the, the followers there's chance um things have a pattern they're predictable we can feel familiar and you know bring people into a pattern um and uh lauren and uh um charles were pointed 
in similar ways in some of the uh, uh, Kiko Lab calls. Mm -hmm. How can we basically come up with um, light rituals that weren't cultish that basically could streamline um, communication and you know get some shared assumptions out of the way so we don't have to keep on revisiting them over and over and over. And over. Um, um, interesting, but uh, that's my riff. I, I um, um, and then certainly it is a riff and not kind of a, a more considered kind of uh, engagement. But um, asking. So, so thanks, Mark. If I may riff on your riff. Um, so let me go back to screen share for a second because um, the thing that you were just describing. Uh, there was one dead end alley that this speak to, speech act theory and commitments went down and it turned into a tool called the coordinator by a company called action technologies. Uh, the coordinator was basically an email imagine an email system where every time you start an email you have to say, is this a request, is this a, a reply, is this a negotiation, like what exactly is it. Uh, and the system would track all your open requests, all your like, like the system was almost like a little project management system behind the scenes that was tracking the status of every one of these things. And the, the this theory of speech act theory came from Fernando Flores and a couple other people, uh, apparently J.L. Austin and uh, a few others, performative utterances, the language game uh, predates it, uh, which I forgot I put in here, which is from Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of, of stuff here around it. Uh, but the coordinator wound up being called Naziware. Um, and it was, an, it was an untouchable thing. And it wound up being called this because it turns out that humans don't really like or naturally uh, at the beginning of an email decide exactly what that email's purpose is going to be. And we're not that concise. And very often we mix five things into one email. We, we like overlap. We're we're subtly, we're, do, we're doing an indirect request. So when we're asked to, to like make it a formal request, it's like, ah, I didn't mean that. So a lot of subtlety of communication was lost, even though the directness was, was supposedly good for us. Imagine my surprise in 2007, which is many years later after the coordinator. Imagine my surprise in 2007 that some of these people have come together and are trying to float a company called Forspires to inspire, conspire, perspire, and aspire. Um, which is basically a repackaged coordinator. And they pitched me, they, they, they pitched me their software and I'm like, this is exactly the coordinator, isn't it? And they're like, well, yeah, kind of. Um, and this didn't, this didn't go any place either. And, and all of which was a dead end, but not to say that there's like a pony, there's not a pony here because what you just said about um, keep from me visiting the same thing over and over and over again, that phrase is a major uh, reason why OGM exists open global mind. Because one of my conclusions after feeding a, map, a mind map for 23 years, and you've got experience since 1984, um, is that when you have a consistent memory to go to, you don't have to go back and revisit all the things because you can go back and say, oh, this, this is what we agreed on over here. And this is the state of our knowledge of this piece over here, exactly. And over here, we realize we have three big open questions. And if you want to talk about one of those big open questions right now, awesome, let's do that. And, and maybe even better and richer and more equitable, each of us would have our own perspective on those things. It's not that we have to agree uh, that there's no open issues in this dark corner over here, because that would be a good way to marginalize people who have important open questions, right? If, there, if, if like Wikipedia, there had to be one canonical page for each important issue agreed to between large numbers of people, that I think that would suck. That would actually break. So this needs to, this needs to be a map or a, a territory that preserves our own point of view on these different issues. Um, and that's really hard. Uh, and that brings me back to the question of how many people are willing to do that or could do that or how could we do that? Um, and it brings me back to how few people there are, you know, as a proportion of the whole population who were obsessively mind mapping or roaming or obsidianing or subtle casting or there's a whole bunch of communities doing personal knowledge management, personal knowledge graphs, I have a whole series of subcategories, all of which, all of whom I'd like to invite in to our conversation as our conversation expands in order to create a shared memory of some sort. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have a naive assumption, to, I think two assumptions here. One of them is that for Wikipedia, most humans on earth 
have not edited ever a page on the Wikipedia, don't know how, aren't interested, they don't want to touch the thing and break it. <clears throat> so the Wikipedia has been done by tens of thousands of people, max, right? Uh, who've created this vast resource, which, you know, if, if half the Earth's population are online, I'd be willing to bet that half of that half have touched the Wikipedia just by reading an, a, a page somewhere. It is extremely well known. It's always one of the top 10 traffic websites. Uh, it's, it's, it's in insane number of languages, which is why I can go to the pop world population scale and say I, I'm willing to bet even in lots of different you know, uh, places in the world, people know about Wikipedia. So the, my conclusion from that is that a uh, few people who are pretty madly obsessed about something, building an easy to use shared resource can in fact make something useful for pretty much everybody. So that, that's a really important. And then my other assumption, and this one is, is this is a hypothesis to test, <clears throat> and I'm writing this into sort of a proposal right now, um, is that could we do something that is one step more complicated than posting a link to Instagram or Twitter or Tumblr or you know, name your favorite socials? Because billions of people have gotten extremely accustomed to posting lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff to these to their socials, including hashtags. And hashtags are metadata. And they're very sophisticated metadata. And people are really clever in how they use hashtags, like really clever. And that is a very bright spot for me because for me, it's like, okay, so could I crawl inside the head of the, the Instagram thing that just before you post, could you add one more thing that gives you the visual richness of a semantic map or a, where does this go in my history? Or I don't know exactly how to even say it. Okay, and somebody's going to invent this, I'm pretty sure. Because, because if there's something sim almost as simple as Instagram, that gives us the semantic richness of a shared memory, then we have a whole bunch of people who are contributing to the shared memory. Then this thing sort of takes off a lot faster than if you have to be like a monk, a cultish monk who's mastered a special tool like Kumu or the brain or, or, or even Rome, which is just an outliner with backlinks, but it's still a specialty tool, right? Um, right, now, right now, in order to feed the fungus, you've got to be a monk. Right, you've got you've got to master a master a tool, and and the tools don't even talk to each other. <clears throat> that sucks. But but in a world where it was much easier to do the gesture, the speech act, the whatever that that is connective and and weaves weaves whatever just happened, whatever you're staring at, whatever whatever insight you just had, puts it in the right place so that it's findable. That is cool, and that's right where I'm aiming. And so, and so one of the things I say is that we're, as a, as a civilization, we are very easy to spin right now. We're really easy to manipulate right now by politicians because we keep going over and over the same things. And Donald Trump was the perfect example of this. And one of my wish list items was if the press corps had a persistent memory someplace, and if they agreed, they said, here's a list of six lies that Donald Trump is always saying in every press conference, every, every time he speaks, he says these six lies. We make a pact a suicide pact that the moment he touches any one of these six, and we'll, we'll show him this list, he'll know that he'll know the list. And we'll say, the moment you touch any of these six third rail uh, topics, we will turn off our cameras and leave the room together, which cuts off his oxygen. Because Trump understood that none of the news entities could ever cut off the camera, that their business model depended on showing the circus he was putting on for everybody. And so, and so maybe a shared memory might have been a, one mechanism to help shut off the oxygen to a very, very toxic and poisonous mechanism that was eating our society and still is right now, right? <clears throat> so that's one of my naive hopes about how, about how a shared memory could be helpful. And, and when you say testing, um, what are the propositions um, that might be testable where it comes to some of these shared memory ideas. Um, so I read it, I just, I'll, I'll post it. Um, let me just find it in, in my brain and then I'll post it. Uh, um, so uh, actually, let me go to uh, MVT. Um, minimum viable testing is what the, the thing is called. This is the article I read. Uh, I will copy this link right now. Actually, let me go back to minimum uh, viable testing. <clears throat> so 
Uh, Stacy, are you familiar with minimum viable product? No. Okay, so there's a whole thing called startup culture or lean startup, uh, which has come out of Silicon Valley and a whole bunch of people making a lot of startups. And they were like, how do we automate this process? How do we, how do we like do this more efficiently? And minimum viable product says, hey, at the start of your startup, try to put up your service, but in this thinnest bare bones fashion. And what is the minimum viable product you could possibly ship? So forget about the all singing, all dancing brain or browser or email client or whatever. What is the least you could do that proves you can do it? Okay. And that's called minimum viable product. And it's, it's worked really well. Like, like that gets people somewhere. The problem is that this assumes that what you're designing is your whole product, except some, some, some piece of your whole product. And that's the goal of the minimum viable product. Minimum viable testing says, hey, the, the thing you think you're inventing probably has a couple of assumptions buried in it. Could you test those assumptions separately in throwaway experiments to figure out if there really is a market there or if there really is a, a thing there? And the test doesn't have to look like your product at all. So this is a way of liberating yourself from designing the product early and saying, let's test a couple of our assumptions early. And so this article here, the minimum viable testing process, which was written by Gagan Biyani and published in first round review, first round capital is a venture firm. And so I read this and I, I then took, okay, there's an MV, a minimum viable uh, testing framework, uh, list the riskiest assumptions, test your assumptions through tests. Here's the three-step MVT process. This is all what I got from the article, right? Um, and uh, so this is my way of memorializing and making more useful what was inside of this article. Um, and if we were lots of us doing this, that could be pretty useful. So now let me get the, the link and share it with you all. There's so that's that there assumption go. right there. Yes. If there are lots of us doing it, it could be blank, pretty useful. That. Um, thank you for helping um, Stacy and I you know, understand more about the minimum viable test. But it is those propositions to test that I'm looking to understand. So, so exactly. So um, one proposition to test is, um, is there something slight, one step more complicated than Instagram that would lead people to create enough semantic in metadata <clears throat> to give us brain-like or Rome-like context. So I would challenge in, in, a, in a productive way mm -hmm. um, that um, we need to work on that propositional statement. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, of course. <laughs> That's, that, that, that's my best framing all by myself. It hasn't been yeah, pressure tested well, by anybody. So sure. um, what's Instagram is, is actually a um, honest question because I've actively avoided it. Now, yeah. now that's um, uh, but you can, you know, almost, you can that's almost a heresy of, of, uh, of Ludditism in, in today's world. It's just, you know what? I don't want to deal with Instagram. Um, please, thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it can do plenty without me and I can do without it. Um, so as easy as Instagram is something I don't actually understand. Um, so briefly, um, I have an Instagram account. I barely, barely, barely use it. I really don't like it. I'm all over the Twitters. I love Twitter. I have, I'm Twitter user number 509, by the way. Like I was the 509th person to sign up for Twitter. Um, um, I, and I don't have zillions of followers or anything like that. I don't know that I've used it well, but I love it. And I, and I, love, I love how I use it. And then there's, uh, you know, Tumblr and now TikTok. I can't stand TikTok, but boy, these things are taking off. Like TikTok View viewership numbers are approaching YouTube viewership numbers right now, which is to me a mind blower because the number of humans that sit in front of YouTube and spend a lot of time watching videos is, is, is huge. That's like a gigantic number. And that TikTok is getting close to that is amazing. So I'm using Instagram as a placeholder for, for shit that's barely use, useful, but really popular that if we added a tiny thing to it, if we put like a bolt on the side, might actually create great social value. 
And so, and so the thing I'm looking for from Instagram is popularity and it's ease of use to this point. Like, like lots of people know how to take an Insta photo. And what I didn't realize was the Insta app is not a camera app. You have to take your photo in something else and then use Insta to upload it. What? Kind of crazy. I'm not on it either. So I don't, I'm with you, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but like Instagram is gigantic. Instagram is also owned by Facebook. So it's part of the Facebook conglomerate. Um, but, but, you know, uh, their user numbers are gigantic. So that's what I'm looking for from using Instagram as an example. So this is a pattern. Um, uh, which was uh, Instagram has uh, roughly uh, 1 billion monthly active users. So sure. But this is a pattern that was brought up by, by Pete Kaminsky in two different calls. Um, shit. That's not very popular, but that's very useful as opposed to shit. That's not very useful, but very popular. Right. So, so that, you know, that, um, that Venn imp- diagram or that plane impedance, or whatever. That impedance mismatch. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Stacy, these are technical terms that might be a little weird, but basically um, when one abstract concept doesn't map over to another abstract concept, kind of like mixing metaphors in uh, programming, uh, that's sometimes called an impedance mismatch, um, which ties to elect- electricity <laughs> in a way I can't, I, I can't yet explain. Um, but anyway, <laughs> the, the um, building a community of practice that basically is able to um, use tools in common um, and basically, you know, again, going back to our, our Saint, um, our Saint Doug, um, Engelbert, um, you know, augmenting human communities. Um, how can Jerry, Stacy, and Mark work together in ways that Jerry, Stacy, and Mark could not do five minutes ago um, or, or, you know, when we go off alone, uh, we can't do, we can't continue to do because we're not together or, or we're not. Um, I mean, it's the uh, uh, getting back to Pete's point and a point I try to stress is that the training that Engelbart talks about and the amount of time that humans need to be able to grok something and especially grok something in concert um, is something that I think we should look at as a resource rather than, oh my God, we can't do this because most of the world won't, won't, um, let me try to summarize this, a, a, wonderful young girl you know was looking at my memex and she said this will never fly it's all about thinking and people don't want to think now the question that you brought up jerry the assumption that i'd like to test is are there mindless kinds of activities that people can make with that one bolt on their behavior less mindless and in that aggregate add to the aggregate knowledge of um, humankind or is it basically just data to sell you stuff or as as i love what brewster says it makes the internet more creepy um And so that I'm trying to isolate that kind of propositional test that you wonderfully bring up with this minimal viable test idea um, and say, aha, you know, "Ah, Jerry's got something. He's got 
a statement, whether that statement is you know, valid or, or it's a testable statement. Will lots of people doing shit that's not very useful, but very popular be able to use by, or is it a different order of usefulness than shit that's very useful, but not very popular? Um, and and Stacy, jump in if you if you want to jump in, and we're we're just kind of like be, batting the ball back and forth here in, in a really nice way. So several things. Um, one of my working in, so back in ninety four ninety five, I realized I hated the word consumer. Smartest thing I've done for thirty years is pay attention to that word and its effects on society. I realized that we had consumerized our lives, and we were all being treated as mere consumers instead of as citizens. When you do that, it's kind of a self fulfilling prophecy. And what you get is stupider humans than civilization sort of actually is, right? And so it's really easy to say, people just wanna stay home and be couch potatoes. They wanna veg out, look how many TikTok videos they're watching. What, it's really, really simple to slip in and say, people are too dumb to do this. They're never gonna do this. But then, I've, then, then I discover, and this may just be a naive belief of mine, but it's a belief of mine, that you can, you can talk to somebody who you think is kind of stupid and then, once you find the thing they're passionate about, yes. baseball, cannabis, what have you, they're like a genius and they can tell you statistics. They, they know, they understand stats. They can, they can argue for this team should have fired this manager because this, this, and this, and this. And they, have, they have an eidetic memory of, of, of snapshots of moments that prove some thesis about some player, I don't know what it is, right? But, but once, once you tap into something where somebody has a passion and it can be the most trivial thing in the world, um, yes, you can, you can suddenly see that they're not dumb, they're just interested in this little thing. And by the way, my own, I'm bringing in the first thesis, they're probably pretty justified in doing so because the world is tuned for consumers and treating people as mere consumers and it's kind of fucked up. And I can understand why people are really pissed off. And this brings in a completely different thing, which was a week after Hillary lost the election to Donald Trump, I realized that I had set aside all of my wishful thinking about how to redesign the world on a basis of trust. I had set all, the side, all the, that aside unconsciously as I voted for the, what I was hoping to be the first female president of the United States, because I realized that Hillary Clinton was a, a protector of the status quo, not a big change artist. She wasn't going to go in and cause wholesale change. Um, she was going to do what her husband had done, what Obama did, what a bunch of other Democrats have done, which is like protect the status quo, um, which as far as I'm concerned is quite broken too. So, so I, I, had a, I had the same, there was a flow chart early in the election cycle that said, uh, is shit broken? Yes, no. And under yes was Bernie and Donald and under no were all the other candidates. And that flow chart was right. It was like, the, like a lot of Bernie people went over to Trump because they saw that Bernie didn't win the nomination and that the system was in fact fundamentally broken. And I believe that a lot of smart people voted for Donald Trump because he was a fire ship. And a fire ship, you know, in the, in the, in the age of sail, a fire ship was one old ship you took from the fleet, you loaded it up with all kinds of flammable shit, you got upwind of the enemy, you basically lit your ship on fire and then pushed it toward the enemy and hoped that you caught a bunch of their ships on fire and destroyed them. And it worked, like fire ships are really dangerous. Right. So Trump was a fire ship being aimed at the system, which is broken. So this is a couple of different digressions. But I also believe that once people start to get a sense of agency and the words sort of the sense of agency is really important here. And I'm having several conversations with my buddy, Marie Bierde about this and other sorts of things around education and so forth. Um, and and the, this sense of agency is incredibly important in her worldview. It's like once kids get a sense of agency, you can turn them loose. They're good, but, but you have to protect that sense of agency and nurture that sense of agency. And then they're off and running. The consumerization that has happened to humans has removed our sense of agency. Your only responsibility as a good consumer is to go buy more shit, even shit you don't need. If you stop buying more shit, the economy grinds to a halt and we all die, right? Whereas a citizen is interested in building stuff with each other, sharing stuff with each other. Oops, one shared car gets rid of 13 purchased cars. That's bad for the economy. Stop the car sharing thing. All of that. And all of that factors in here. So I have a belief that we can tap, we, that the experience of building a shared memory 
is one aha kind of experience that lets people feel a sense of agency. And I use Wikipedia all the time as an example of this. I'm like, I ask audiences, who's used the Wikipedia? All the hands go up. Who remembers the first time they realized how the Wikipedia works? And like 50% of the people hold their hands up. And I'm like, how did you feel at that moment? And I wrote a post about this called the two oh shits, right? And people go through two predictable responses to things like Wikipedia and things, systems designed from trust. The first oh shit is, what do you mean any idiot on the planet could change this thing? This is the stupidest thing anybody's ever invented. There's no way this could work. That's the first oh shit. And then many people leave and they're like, I'm not even touching it. This is unreliable, not going to go there. But most people slip through and start looking at it. And then they discover that there's, an, there's a Wikipedia page for every episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And that the, and that the pages are actually really deep and good. You're like, the second oh shit is, oh shit, this is working. And then I think, this is just my amateur theory, I have no proof points for this, but I think that people start going, that was cool, how do I get more of this? How did that work? And how do I get more of this? And nobody knows because nobody understands the general principles that are happening. And the principles of Wikipedia are all about trust. They're like, yes, we, we, we leave the key in the door because you want the people who are passionate about anything to find their way to the thing they have passion about and go contribute to the shared thing that's in the generative commons. But the problem with Wikipedia is that it's an encyclopedia. It's not allowed to have an editorial point of view. It, it, it isn't designed to preserve individual perspectives or other sorts of things. It's meant to be a collective asset, which is great. It does its, it does its job really well. But how do we get, how do we layer stuff on top of it in ways that are fruitful for, for humans is kind of where I'm heading. Um, and so, so Mark, I totally agree. And I think that I think that, that that gradient between things that are popular but useless and, and unpopular but very useful, I'm very interested in, in where those things touch, right? Because I've been using, I've been addicted to a geeky tool for 23 years <clears throat> that very few, like the brain's perennial problem is getting people to stick to it and use it. You know, and, Jerry? Yeah. It's in the boundaries. It's in the in-between the zero and the one the liminal spaces yeah we we have we have a zero we have a one and that's digital um but there's an in-between <laughs> um so boy uh what you're saying is is useful uh, small small added note if you go look at any highly popular online game mm -hmm. the shit you have to know to play these games like i i watch esports every now and then and i'm like I just have no concept of what spell just conquered what thing just to, like there's, there's a team going in doing something and I have really no idea what's happening on the ground. And there's a bunch of people who really know it to the point where there's like lots of money now floating around in this as a sport, right? That, it, that is another example of when people find something that, that they're passionate about, they're pretty damn smart. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mark, go ahead. And you're muted. Do you want to come back in? I think he's answering somebody else. Oh, okay, good. <clears throat> cool. And I've got to stand up for a sec. But um, actually, here. you know, I was typing uh, a phrase. Uh -huh. When people find something that they're passionate about, and boy, I've, I've even, you know, I've still misspelled it. But <laughs> um, it takes time to type out in one's notes. Um, yes. Even write down. Um, uh longer terms so shorter terms tend to get captured <laughs> hi and you know it's just experience um agree that you know it, it pisses me off and i i brought this up in one of the ogm calls that it's an us against them we're the smart liberal elites and they're the dumb, you know, people in the, you know, flyover country. I hate that. It pisses me off Bad. because everybody that I meet when I travel has that, you know, human spark inside them that when you connect with that, they're just people and they are sacred and divine and they're beastly and 
you know, potential death camp employees. You know? Sometimes within a couple hours of each other. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I, I hate to bring some of these, you know, metaphors up, but um, boy, um, one of the one of the questions that could come up that I am getting from the theme of this call is um, trust versus consumerism. Um, and I certainly think that can be refined. Um, but um, but basically, when we have a simple benefit for ourselves and can integrate that into um, the the fabric of of daily life um, then let, let me step back a second sure I'm, I'm trying to remember what that notion was not of fine art but of low art i think i think i called it low art um not an art that belongs in the museum but an art that basically um gives a quality of experience to our daily lives um, that's not a acute experience that takes us away from our daily lives, but it actually makes our daily lives richer. So we don't really need to go away to a museum as much to see this great experience, even though great experiences are, are absolutely fantastic. We, we, we do need those experiences. But what do we do in the chronic um, experiences? Um, I took an architecture, psychology of architecture course where we talked about the difference between an acute experience that happens, you know, big, you know, a few times and a chronic experience, which is you're going down, you're opening your front door over and over and over and again. And is that experience improving your life or diminishing it? Um, and so, you know, but that's the level of attention that someone else can give to a product that improves our daily life in some, in some way that we unconsciously are able to improve our lives by say drinking water as opposed to drinking Coke. Um, and it's time for me to let Stacy have the last word. <laughs> no i just when you said a simple benefit for ourselves i think that's really key um and for those people that jerry that you referenced that would never think of doing any the simple benefit for them is that they feel as if somebody is hearing them you know they feel and they will put in that effort yep yep and and also if it's functionally useful for them. So, so uh, Klaus is running a project on community food systems. Like, uh, uh, man, if, if we managed to sort of create some collective wisdom and leave it at hand so that it was insanely useful for new farmers who were trying to figure out how to make a go of it, and that this, that, that this wisdom connected them up to sources of financing or uh, resources that they didn't know about or, or do-it-yourself instructions for how to do something that they actually really need. You know, uh, there's the, 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 the sort of semi-documentary, the, the Biggest Little Farm, which is pretty good, except at one point, the guy acts almost as if he discovers that ducks love snails and slugs, right? He's got a snail and slug problem on his farm and they're, they're just like everywhere. They're eating everything. And suddenly, voila, guess what? Ducks just like gorge on these things. Well, this has been well known around the world for a really long time. You go to China, this, they got, they've got herds of ducks that run all over the place, partly because they like to eat duck, but they use them in this way. So 
that that I just use that as a tiny nugget of wisdom that that ought to be propagated and easily at hand when you when you have a, a problem or a situation. And a lot of these little aha moments are very contextual. Like you don't really care about a large flock of ducks unless you've got a farm and a slug problem, um, right? Uh, or you're raising ducks for 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 their meat, which hopefully we stop like killing animals for meat soon someday. Um, but but. I think a piece of this is just about like uh, making, I, I'm, I'm, I'm recently particularly interested in how to, and I don't know why even the right word is, I call it how to instrument information so that it's more useful. And it turns out that instrument is probably the wrong word entirely. But what I mean is, um, it, my example comes from one of the pattern languages that, that is in a, one of, the, of our neighboring communities. So there's a, there's a pattern language called liberating structures which is all about group process. And if you're a facilitator, it was invented by a bunch of black belt genius facilitators and they are trying to distill their wisdom, which is what pattern languages do. And so one of the patterns in liberating structures is called one, two, four, all. And it says, if you have a difficult question in front of your group, a useful process you might apply is give everybody some solo time, one, to just think about it. And it could be like a minute or three minutes or whatever, uh, pair them up, put them in fours and then come back to plenary, come back to everybody. And in that way, the ideas will be juicier. They will have met more people. It's a really nice group process. And by instrumenting this to be useful, I mean, one, two, four, all lives in a book, which where it's trapped by digital rights management. It lives on a web page where it's sitting on a web page waiting to be discovered, but it could be a Zaplet. So Zoom just launched uh, and one of our friends, Ross Mayfield is now at Zoom in charge of this project. Zoom launched zaps or zaplets, I'm forgetting which is what they're called, little apps that click into Zoom. So imagine, imagine a Zoom app that implements one, two, four, all and implements a little bit of facilitation genius. It's like you're in the middle of running a meeting in Zoom and you're like, gosh, I could use some group process. And somehow you talk to a little chat bot and you say, what, what group process is appropriate given this? And it asks you a couple of questions, says, here's one, two, four, all. And then you click on it and it says, oh, good. I will choreograph this for you. I'm going to put up a timer, change the times if you want, but I'm going to step you through so you don't have to sit there and go, okay, that was two minutes now and watch your phone. And then all of the, all of the crusty stuff that is just software, it's really easy to do, could be done by a Zaplet. So how do we lather, rinse, repeat on that process on all of the juicy wisdom in the world? How you, do we, you are pardon? also describing Natsuware at the same time. Um, it, how do you mean? It, it's for, you know, that for it's the and and i hate to use that term um but um that kind of control in interaction is welcomed by people who are familiar with the process and benefit and people who are unfamiliar with that it's like i don't want the machine to tell me what to do it's not so i want to leave things at hand Okay. Um, as openly and customizably as possible. I don't want to tell people what to do at any point. Sure. But 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 if you were having trouble breaking through with an idea or something, you wanted some ways to do that, I want an easy way for you to discover, here's three different things you could try right now. And then I want it really simple to implement those one of those three ideas as you choose to do it. But I'm not trying to impose this process on anybody. I, I agree. Um, anyway, are, are we at the end of the call? Um, if we, if we'd like to wrap, we can wrap. I mean, um, uh, I could keep, I could do this all day, but we should probably get back to our days. Um, I, I simply need to take, uh, what others call a bio break. If, if this continues to eight 30, um, or, uh, um, I'd be happy to again, join, um, next week. Or... We could also pick up later. Uh, Stacy, how are you feeling? Um, I, I, so much of what you're saying is like over my, you know, it's not my subject area. So I'm still trying to figure out after years already of other groups, what is it they're looking to do? And because I'm coming from the, I'm coming from the motivational point, you know, like what would cause me to use something? Mm -hmm. So it's, again, and I'm, I also am looking at the people problems of just people working together and collaborating. So for me, I still like this idea of starting with a question because that, that 
keeps that choice, but it also keeps a boundary. And then, I, I mean, this is just what I did when I first came on Facebook, like on my page, I would ask questions and they would be open-ended questions. And by, first of all, people would respond. You know, I would see in other groups, they were complaining about engagement. I had lots of engagement because the questions were worded in a way that your answer would reflect where you're coming from. Uh -huh. There was no, you know, sometimes people will say, well, do you mean this or that? And I was like, well, what do you think? Because right. it was all about, I want to hear what you're motivated to speak on. So it's a little, it's a little hard for me to um, integrate everything. That makes sense. And, and the kind the way you were asking questions was sort of a facilitation skill. Correct. That you have, right? Um, yes. I met a guy recently who wrote the book, uh, The Book of Questions. I think I mentioned him a while ago. <clears throat> um, so he's the author of The Book of Questions and he's you know, done well from the royalties of that. He has some spin-offs of, of it, you know, questions for families, questions for kids, whatever. Um, but he has kind of an algorithm for how do you ask a question that won't get you down a political or religious rat hole but it's still a challenging and interesting question. And I'll make one up, but you know, if you could add 20 years to your life, but you had to give up X, would you, which, which way would you go, right? Or if you could add 20 years to your life, but other people would, would lose a year, like, but 20 other people would lose a year, would you do it, right? And that's a, that's a really interesting sort of moral, ethical, uh, practical kind of question. And he's got millions of them. And he's, he's basically right now launching an app that, that does this, where you can create questions for your dinner party, for your conversation with your partner or whatever. It's such um, an art form. And, and it's, it's, an, and it's an art form. The question makes such a difference. Bingo. And, and so you have the sensitivity to understand that. Many people don't. How do we bring that wisdom, that insight, a little bit closer to more people? That's a good question. I mean, I'm with Mark in terms of hating that we're so divided. And I mm -hmm. do spend I kind of a lot of time with people talking to people that I don't agree with, but I make, but I, I, and this is, I say this all the time, I kind of sort people into two groups and it really has to do with the way they think, not their values or anything, but the way they argue, are mm -hmm. they reasonable? Can they, you know, can they see a nap? Can they get analogies or can they, can they measure, a, I can't find the right words, um, how much cognitive dissonance do they have? That's, mm -hmm. a, that's the best way to say that. And that goes across, you know, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. in every group. It's not that, you know, liberals are less cognitive, you know, no, they're just as bad. Right. Um, not just as bad because they tend to be more, no, but seriously, they do, tend to be more for education and that in and of itself has some underlying um you know stuff going on exactly but anyway so yeah this was this was interesting i like hearing it because some of it settles in even though i couldn't explain it yeah i still have a i'm getting closer but i still would like to there's a couple of people like i would like to just watch you talk to like i have couple of other people in mind that I would just like to observe a conversation that I wouldn't necessarily understand the specifics, but it would help me to understand other things. Does mm -hmm. that make any sense? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Makes a lot of sense. Um, cool. I think Mark has well, done, well, done, done well <laughs> to do his bio break. Um, which is great. And I'm, and I'm realizing I should actually get back to writing a proposal I have to write. So um, we should probably wrap the call. I'm just waiting for Mark to come back. Okay. Um, Are you interested at some point in having that pop-up call that Bentley also expressed an interest for? Yes. In terms of, and I'm actually having a call with Allison tomorrow, so I'll mention it to her as well. Sounds great. Do you mind sending an email describing the call to me and to Bentley, and then we can just use that to pick a time? Sure. Sure. I'm just going to use one question. <laughs> Sound, sounds great. That'll work, that'll work just fine. That should be that should be good. Um, and I am having uh, conversations with Wendy Elford. What's happened to my video? I don't know. But um, not Wendy Elford. Um, Wendy McLean.
uh-huh. um, about uh, her visual idea, which is much more complicated than I thought. And she has a eight page um, uh, a PDF um, for, which um, uh, has a particular kind of what I would call a mandala. Uh, uh -huh. So it's a, a it's a semi fixed kind of directional um, information diagram based on concentric circles. That's my first impression. That it's deeper than that, but I haven't grokked it yet. And I'm meeting with uh, Julian Gomez as well, awesome. who uh, um, has some kind of 3D kind of thing, um, which I'm I don't know the least thing about but uh but hope to understand and certainly um uh, this uh was a good conversation thank you stacy jerry and um uh certainly there's a lot that we've left untouched um but um you know step by step one thing i heard and i don't remember if it was in an ogm call or it was a different um venue but we all want community, but God, people. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, it's so frustrating. Um, uh, I wanted to, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I wanted to add one thing that I just remembered because back when you were talking about trust and, and all that kind of stuff and consumer, like I, I can go way deep on these topics and these are passion topics for me and I don't bring them into OGM that much that often. Um, and I'm and I'm busy trying to figure out what role these things play in the larger picture. But I have a you know the website designed from trust.com. I own and there's a couple things on there like the two o shits is is, a, is an essay that I posted um, on that website. But you know there's a whole bunch of examples of design from trust in the world. Uh, in, in fact, it's under a thought that has more things connected to it. So examples of the relationship economy in action because in 2010. If you had asked me what I did, I, I would have told you that I'm exploring the relationship economy. And I realized only later that much of that work was really about trust. So, you know, uh, nonviolent communications is a, uh, oh, nonviolent social action, but peer to peer learning, open content, microfinance, uh, good relationships bring happiness, et cetera. All of these things relate to um, these things in action. So, Anyway, uh, I can I can go on for hours about this, and I'm busy trying to figure out uh, which parts and how much to bring into which conversations in what way. Because uh, one of my beliefs is that design from trust is a way that people can experience a sense of agency. Because when you trust them again, but what we've done is we stop trusting people. We've built institutions that are coercive in large ways, because we don't trust everybody, so we have to limit everybody's behavior so that they do the same thing and do it predictably, um, and then when you trust people to like hold each other and, and be responsible, um, good things mostly happen and, and people get the sense of agency. So another example of, of design from trust is open space. Have either of you been to an open space meeting? Um, so <clears throat> so I, I took a, by some weird thing, I, I brought myself in the summer of 92 or 93, I took a class from Harrison Owen, the guy who invented open space. Um, he had, uh, and then uh, like a decade earlier, he had uh, worked for a year on a chemistry conference that had white papers and keynote speakers and, and you know, side panels and all this. And he realized at the end of the conference that he had just poured his life energy into, he realized that at the end of the conference that the best part of the conference was the coffee breaks and the hallway conversations. <clears throat> and so he invents open space, which is a way of turning the hallway conversations into the conference. <clears throat> and, and I'm a trained open space facilitator, uh, you, you convene a group, you have a focusing question, something you're trying to answer, and then you spend 20 minutes at the beginning introducing the process, which is counterintuitive, and says, hey, um, I'm, I'm going to ask all of you to come in and tell us what we should talk about. What are the topics that matter to answer this question together? <clears throat> and then you're going to take your question and post it on the schedule, which has rooms and times, like one hour, one hour slots over, uh, over today, and an open space could run three full days. That's a, a typically an open space is it's like a three day process. I've run a one hour open space, um, but but then he, you explain the law of two feet, uh, butterflies and bumblebees and a bunch of other sorts of things. And the law of two feet says if you're in a conversation and it's not working, 
um, feel free to get up and go somewhere else because your your job is to find your way to the, the place where your interests and talents are best used in this whole series of conversations. And, and it, like you give people permission to go release their genius into the space. And uh, I've, I, 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 the, the one hour open space I did was with a, the government of Singapore at a conference on national security and terrorism. <clears throat> and the guy I was busy organizing this, this with at one point sent me back an email. His name was Patrick Nathan. And he sent me back an email that said, well, well how about if we do this and this and this? And I, and, I, and I wrote him back and I said, we could do those things, but it would no longer be anything like open space. And then I explained a little bit about the trust thing. And then his next email back to me was like, oh God, okay, I get it. And, and what we ended up doing was, was pretty good, like, like the, on, the, on the trust vector. And in Singapore, which is a high control society, <clears throat> you know, he was making a big leap and it was a big deal, but it was really cool. It was totally fun. What you just, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What you described, that's exactly why I want that pop-up call starting with what are the things we want to measure that would determine how sustainable or thrivable a project was. And the hope is that after that, there would be different calls that would veer off, you know, for each one of the, uh, what would the word, each one of, what are we measuring? Sub-themes sub, you know? sub or uh, yeah. measurables or whatever, yeah. Yes, yeah. that that would mm -hmm. then become its own call. So mm -hmm. it's the same idea. Cool, that's great. Um, so if you'll send a note to me and Bradley, yes. um, uh, like presenting the, the pithiest version of your question, then we'll set up a call and, and invite everybody else who wants to show up and on our way. Sounds good. Sounds great. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.